welcome to today's lecture. We will continue our discussion on the application of fluid inclusion microthermometric data to understand ore forming environment, the hydrothermal ore deposits in particular. Today we will uh, discuss some other important deposit types and uh, the possibly the uh, most obvious one when we talk about a magmatic hydrothermal system are the porphyry copper deposit. So, this particular uh, inform this particular this diagram this picture and the information is retrieved from some old literature. This is from Reuter 1971 where there was some comparison of the uh, Bingham, uh, Butte and the Climax uh, porphyry this Bingham and Butte are the porphyry copper deposit and Climax is the porphyry molybdenum deposit. I will be restricting the discussion to only to porphyry copper uh, system. Uh, so, in the old literature only we will see that this uh, uh, documentation uh, is uh, the way that. Uh, so, here we could see the inclusions that are described from this uh, porphyry system. So, we know that if we have to look at the porphyry copper deposits the typical ones occurring in the uh, western American Cordillera or in the Chilean Andes are the ones which will uh, give us uh, the idea about the porphyry system. Even though as I have said that there could always be some uh, differences sometimes very significant across uh, deposits which are categorized into similar or the same uh, type which is the porphyry type. One of the major uh, one of the very interesting aspect of the porphyry type deposit is that since they are magmatic uh, hydrothermal fluid and the magmatic hydrothermal fluid is essentially the one which exhausts from a crystallizing granitic pluton and in the in the uh, porphyry copper deposits in the Cordilleran or the Chilean Andes uh, region they are the ones where the the plutons are shallow or emplaced in shallow conditions where the fluid could uh, evolve by boiling and this boiling of the fluid generally gives rise to uh, the components which are vapor rich and the uh, the aqueous component which becomes extremely briny or very concentrated or uh, uh, very extremely saline which is exemplified by occurrence of such kind of vapor rich inclusions as shown here and inclusions which will sometimes be described as containing about 10 dotted phases or so and such inclusions when they are uh, subjected to microthermometric uh, experiment heating experiments. Here in this particular inclusion a halide crystal, a sylvite crystal and there is this uh, dark one is uh, essentially interpreted to be a specularite like a hematite crystals and sometimes such this kind of inclusions also do have uh, uh, sulphide uh, like a chalcopyrite grain as a dotted crystal. And during uh, and in a heating experiment it is observed that this halite and the sylvite or the chlorides are actually the one which dissolve, but the uh, other ones like this any sulphide or any other sometimes even the anhydrite kind of mineral uh, the dotted crystals also do not dissolve when the inclusion is heated to very high temperature. But the fact is that these inclusions will be homogenizing at a very very high temperature almost greater than 600 700 degrees Celsius. And uh, so, they do represent, so they, they actually uh, give us a very definitive idea that the these deposits actually have uh, been originated or a one of the sub important contributor of the fluid is the magmatic fluid. So, the presence of both liquid and vapor rich inclusions and the uh, sometimes uh, these uh, inclusions also do have H 2 S and in this old literature we see that these kind of uh, inter interpretations were made from uh, crushing stages. Uh, where the gas could be observed uh, under a microscope and then identified. And uh, so, such kind of, of uh, this entire spectrum of the uh, inclusions that will be studied in this will also have the and they will always be uh, arranged in, uh, in, in, a sp in space exactly the way we see in a porphyry copper system. As we know that in a porphyry copper system we get uh, uh, at the there they do have a uh, zonal pattern of alteration. Uh, we do have a kind of uh, they, they are represented as the lateral or vertical uh, zoning. We do have a potassic core 
potassium core which actually will be exemplified by presence of biotite or potassium feldspar and the, this particular zone potassium core will be the direct or here the actually the magmatically derived fluid plays the role and then generally there will be a zone which will be a phyllic alteration zone which will be sericite quartz sericite uh, rich, uh, uh, typified by an assemblage of quartz and sericite and we get sometimes the ore cells uh, they do they also do contain the chalcopyrite bornite and pyrite mineralization then it is then the surrounded by an argillic these kind of alteration zones are observable in many of the typical porphyry copper deposits then we do have a propylitic alteration zone so what is actually uh, interpreted is that the core part uh, is a result of uh, the uh, uh, the magmatic fluid which is uh, so that in this particular condition the fluid would be mostly be transporting the metal or the high solubility of the metal so it's not expected to be depositing these metals in the form of the ore minerals but only when the fluid uh, there is a warning stage of the fluid or this con 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 the contraction of the vapor and then uh, temperature is uh, decreased then only the uh, solubility of the metals will drop down and there are uh, interpretations that they are later on after the during the warning stage of this uh, hydrothermal activity when the vapor phase is condensed into low saline fluid then the uh, meteoric fluid mixes uh, with the originally originally de magmatically derived fluid and we get the zonal pattern of alteration and the mineralization in uh, conformity with this alteration zone. So, a porphyry copper deposit fluid intrusions should always be studied with respect to where the in, uh, sample has been taken from which alteration zone. So, normally the potassium alteration zone will, uh, will be exemplified by occurrence of this kind of very high temperature fluid and very high saline going to 70, 80 weight percent NSL equivalent and temperature even in excess of 700, 750 degrees Celsius and then the, the stock work and the vein systems in the later uh, alteration zones will, will actually uh, be reflected by the warning stage of the hydrothermal activity and deposition of the uh, ore minerals in specific uh, locales. So, the, so, it, as, uh, so, that is what exactly the scenario which were interpreted in this kind of porphyry copper deposits where the data of a, the salinity will always range from very high saline to very low saline and as well as the temperature. So, the involvement of meteoric fluid uh, becomes very obvious. And uh, so, the magmatic hydrothermal system with the highest temperature and salinity at the core, the system evolves by mixing with the surrounding cooler meteoric water. And uh, uh, the, the, the situation is kind of uh, comparable to what we saw in this uh, thin tungsten deposit, uh, for example, the mole granite uh, scenario that we disc that we considered. That there also the initially magmatically derived fluid was in a two phase condition boiling and then uh, gradually the uh, system with decreasing temperature pressure condition it won and then uh, there was scope for incursion of the uh, less evolved low temperature low saline low salinity fluid to mix and then bring about the mineralization what we saw in case of mole granites similar more or less similar situations are also uh, visualized in these porphyry systems although the uh, the geological setting and the host rock types uh, are a little different and the alteration zones are very characteristic of the porphyry copper deposits. Uh, uh, so, uh, looking at some of the recent literature and uh, taking the example of this uh, El Teniente uh, deposit, uh, uh, porphyry copper deposit uh, in Chile. So, here it is also the uh, mineralization is visualized to have uh, four stages out of which the first one is barren hydrothermal exactly the same way that uh, the originally high temperature magmatically derived fluid uh, was responsible and then a quartz anhydrite brexia with chalcopyrite, bornite and molybdenite. This is coincident with the potassium alteration zone and then it gave rise to a quartz anhydrite vein with chalcopyrite, bornite and magnet and molybdenite. This coincident with the phyllic alteration and then the stage 4 was a brexia and the rare veins with uh, tenantite, chalcopyrite and bornite with tourmaline and sericite and lead gypsum sometimes in typically in a porphyry system tourmaline as a alteration or as a, as a product is sometimes not very uh, common, but this deposit uh, is. Uh, so, the 
fluid inclusions were in this particular deposit as has been uh, given the reference here were described from the stage 2 to stage 4 and we could see the similar situation here that this particular uh, inclusion which is a moderate salinity inclusion this is fluid is very is closest to the exalt uh, from the felsic magma and the inclusions which are represented by this uh, halite as well as the opaque uh, daughter, min, daughter crystal occurring here. They are supposed to be the and these, these ones <coughs> along with the ones which are uh, dominated by vapor are supposedly the result of the boiling and uh, such kind of boiling even uh, which is not shown in this diagram even result in uh, inclusions with multiple daughter phases and the supposedly a very, very high salinity and temperature as well. And uh, these are the moderately saline fluid, these are late in the sequence of evolution. It is uh, sometimes it is envisaged that with the uh, with the decrease in the pressure temperature condition with the condensation of the vapor and uh, mixing with uh, uh, other fluid sometimes uh, a later stage that even even this kind of uh, uh, the boiling and the condensation process also takes place in a very uh, concomitant manner and also in the later stage some high saline uh, fluids are also generated which are entrapped as uh, halide bearing uh, daughter crystals, but they are not as high saline as the ones which are produced from the initial phases of boiling. We could see here is the one uh, halide bearing daughter crystal and uh, these are the inclusions which are the uh, representative of the stage 3 after the collapse of the vapor bubble and the to a higher pressure sometimes attain high salinity and these are the ones which are the uh, stage 4 uh, the almost the barren stage in which the uh, liquid rich aqueous inclusions were trapped. And uh, so, these uh, do also conform to uh, the temperature salinity distribution as we as is generally observed in case of the porphyry copper deposits. Uh, interestingly, the now since uh, these these are taken from the recent literature where in most of these kind of deposits when they are studied there the inclusions are also analyzed by the available analytical technique like ICP LA ICP MS where the inclusion cavity contents are analyzed by an ICP MS the, the method which we will be discussing uh, later part of this lecture series. So, the LA ICP MS uh, results they indicate that these the inclusions which were represented as this uh, one which is almost like the uh, could be considered as the first stage of the fluid uh, or the exactly the magmatically derived uh, fluid of moderate salinity they do have variable uh, concentration of copper in terms of milligram per gram and whereas, the ones where we see these vapor rich inclusions in this uh, stage 3 as well as stage 2 these are the ones which contain uh, copper concentration in the in the range of almost like uh, start a few milligram per gram to sometimes even in, in weight percent ranges and uh, the low salinity inclusions are variable copper this uh, this kind of uh, inclusions which are described here coming from the stage 3 uh, and uh, this is the plot of the temperature uh, salinity weight percent salinity where we could see that these represent the, uh, the inclusions which are almost the stage 2 and stage 3 uh, mineralizing mineralization um, duration during that uh, process where there were many stages of uh, fluid uh, boiling and condensation of the vapor and then these are the ones which are the L4 uh, aqueous inclusions which are very low saline low temperature and where one could always invoke a situation where there could be mixing of late meteoric fluid. So, the, the what is envisaged here is the fluid evolved by boiling separation of large volume of metal and this vapor to give rise to late, later stages of fluid. So, the uh, to quote the author so this is interpreted as the product of injection of a deeply sourced exceptionally copper and probably sulfur rich deep fluid into a more continuously devolatilizing sub volcanic large magma chamber. So, I would also definitely refer that the uh, original work be referred to uh, for a detailed uh, discussion of this, but here we could always make a correlation between what inclusion types one sees and the uh, data when. So, in the older literature when we did not have much of uh, the concentration of different elemental species measured from the individual inclusions uh, in the absence of that the interpretations were mostly based on what the temperature salinity distribution that we get 
and from that we try to interpret our data. Uh, this is the uh, this is also another example of a porphyry copper deposit from the Bazo de Alumbera porphyry copper deposit in Argentina, where the only uh, difference compared to the previous one is that the, the authors here they visualize that this multiple these stages the main stages of mineralization and alteration is actually was caused by only the magmatic fluid without so uh, without involvement of much of meteoric fluid. So, the as I said that when we look at the or you attempt to do a fluid inclusion study, it is always essential to have a good idea about the, the mineralization, the constitution of the min, mineral, the ore body in terms of the mineralogy, the different types of alterations and the stages of this alteration and we says they do because we have some idea that in a porphyry copper system we get the potassic alteration which is the earliest stage and the representing the highest uh, temperature condition and as the temperature goes down they go to propylitic kind of alteration uh, in epidote and uh, chloride kind of assemblage and this is the uh, stage 2 the late potassic stage 3. So, this, this kind of uh, situation could be interpreted by a proper examination of the different types of veins their alteration hollows and the mineralogy of the ore body. So, these, these authors as cited here they interpreted the uh, sequence to have developed in uh, 4 or 5 stages. And the inclusions that they observe were the, uh, the as uh, before in as is observed in many of the porphyry copper deposits the liquid rich inclusion and the vapor rich inclusions and also the very high saline multiple daughter phase bearing inclusions. And uh, here we could see they, they classified their inclusions as class 1, class 2 and class 3. So, the class 1 are the, uh, uh, the aqueous inclusions of variable uh, ratio of the vapor by vapor plus liquid and the ones which are very high saline inclusions containing multiple daughter phases. And here uh, the data are in plotted here we could see that the temperature of homogenization of the inclusions mostly the, uh, the veins during the earlier phases the P veins which is uh, uh, like here do have the record the highest temperature almost even excess of 800 degrees Celsius, which we know that even we cannot determine with uh, the kind of fluid inclusion stage where we have the temperature range of 600 to minus 196. So, they do require uh, a thermometric apparatus which the, where the temperature of range of operation could be still higher. And similarly, the uh, polyphase inclusion is giving salinities well in excess of 60 wet percent and we could see the distribution. and here very interestingly the phyllic alteration is generally of a much of a lower temperature corresponding the potassic and the uh, early potassic and the uh, late potassic alteration zones. And uh, so, it more or less conforms to the uh, picture that we generally are acquainted with about the porphyry copper deposit. So, here the uh, so in, in this the explanation for this evolution of the fluid is interpreted to be uh, a magmatic fluid which uh, evolved up to this kind of a low salinity and low temperature stages and uh, without and where it is interpreted that the meteoric fluid is actually essentially post ore and did not have much of a role to play here. So, in this uh, context I would also like to mention that the fluid characteristics generally when we talk about uh, in terms of salinity at temperature by getting a temp fluid which is uh, moderately low and low saline and uh, the temperature of the order of 200 300 degrees Celsius or sometimes even a little less. They could be interpreted also because there are new ideas coming up as to how a magmatic fluid uh, actually evolves. Sometimes it is observed that most of the alteration characteristics and the fluid evolution can be explained by uh, or without involving any extraneous meteoric fluid. And this generally would be a matter of uh, 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 conjectural, I mean this is definitely uh, a thing which is to be looked into very carefully. And, uh, but the possibility always uh, is there and uh, one would have one has to interpret the fluid inclusion data accordingly. So, here whether uh, so, most of the uh, arguments in favor of a magmatic fluid uh, 
So, for example, if we uh, if we uh, take this particular uh, pan uh, the Bajodi Alumbra case, here the uh, data or the, the idea that led to non involvement of a meteoric fluid during this most of the stages of uh, mineralization and alteration actually has come from the stable isotope data. So, fluid inclusion uh, data cannot individually settle the issue the whether a meteoric fluid was actually involved or not involved. So, in this case uh, the most of the uh, the oxygen isotope data that were that was done on the alteration minerals in the potassic, phyllic and the argillic alteration zones. The authors believe that it all is they all show the signatures of uh, a magmatic fluid which uh, we cannot de uh, describe or cannot discuss in this particular uh, uh, context of discussion, but this uh, original work can be uh, consulted and see or those uh, or because of the oxygen and the uh, hydrogen isotope ratios they do also indicate the fluid ancestry in terms of a meteoric fluid, magmatic fluid or a connate fluid. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, now I would like to discuss something about the about another Indian um, deposit which is a tin bearing granite pragmatic pragmatite system uh, because as I said that typically the uh, scar and type of mineralization uh, which give the majority of the tin tungsten resources like many parts many other parts of the world. In the Indian shield we do not have uh, well established or well documented such kind of scar and deposits maybe some uh, occurrences are there in the trans Arabali region, but this, this is the ones which we got an opportunity to study and here it is essentially the tin bearing pegmatite granite pegmatite system in the Bastar craton amongst amidst the uh, meta sedimentaries uh, belonging to the Sukma series. And uh, here the tin mineralization is in the pegmatites, the pegmatites actually traverse the uh, host meta sediments like quartzites or the schistose rocks are also the meta basics uh, which are the pre existing rock types there. And the pegmatites are present in these uh, lithologies as well as in the granite and the pegmatites which are observed in lithology like quartzite or in the metabasics they, they display typical uh, zone, zoned uh, nature of their occurrence and also have uh, different or are interpreted to have given rise to the mineralization in different stages of uh, cassiterite different generations of cassiterite uh, and uh, uh, along with some columbo tantalite mineralization. So, there have been a one of the even though not a very major resources, but they are being exploited for the tin tungsten uh, tin and niobium tantalum resources. So, here the uh, inclusions were studied from quartz in the pegmatite from all the different types the staniferous as well as non staniferous. Sometimes there are pegmatites which are also barren. So, when we sample the, uh, pegmatite, the tin bearing the staniferous pegmatite or the non staniferous pegmatite we see that the fluid inclusion characteristics are more or less uniform in the sense that we get the aqueous biphase inclusions uh, with low uh, proportion of vapor as well as high proportion of vapor. Although there is no record of any vapor phase homogenization of these aqueous inclusions and we also see polyphase inclusions with uh, containing single halide daughter crystal where the homogenization or the dissolution of the daughter crystal is sometimes either less than the liquid vapor homogenization or more than the liquid vapor homogenization. And uh, uh, look at the uh, ranges the staniferous pegmatite or the non staniferous pegmatite or the quartz veins and also for a comparison the host 2 mica granite also was studied for the fluid inclusions in the matrix quartz. So, you could see uh, what we get here is the salinity and temperature ranges are more or less very overlapping, but if when we see just take an example of the staniferous uh, pegmatites over here and the non staniferous pegmatites we could only we could only interpret in terms of presence of uh, fluids of two different salinities and uh, one could always visualize that the mineralization definitely was brought about by or is likely to have been brought about by mixing of two fluids and when it's a case of metal like tin one would uh, expect that the fluid which is represented by a low salinity characteristics uh, which should be which is more likely to be a meteoric fluid which will be more oxidizing 
and the other fluid which is uh, more saline and is uh, likely to be reducing in nature. So, that it could transport the tin in uh, form of plus 2 uh, the stannous uh, ions in term in form of chloride uh, like chloride complex the SNCl 2 type of chloride complex and these two fluid must have uh, is likely to have mixed and brought about the deposition of the tin in form of the castorite mineralization which kind of uh, conforms to the picture when we take from the staniferous pegmatite either in the meta sediments or in the meta metabasics. As we as against that when you look at the ones which are non staniferous we, we miss either of the two components either a low saline component or the high saline component and then we make our interpretation that what actually would have happened in this kind of situations. So, this is one uh, example. Uh, so, this is a pegmatite from uh, an Indian occurrence which I thought would be worth sharing and uh, also the way that the uh, argument or the logic uh, was uh, put forth and the uh, fluid inclusion data could be interpreted in conformity with what we, what we observe uh, in the mineralization. Well, the Mississippi Valley type deposits uh, are one of the very uh, interesting deposits and are an important deposit in terms of contribution of lead and zinc to the world. We know them occurring in the in the United States, in the tri state, in the state of uh, in the, the Vibernum trend, the state of uh, Tennessee. There are so many uh, such deposits and such type of deposits in uh, other parts of the world are also reported. One of the interesting thing about these deposits is that since they are uh, they do have sphalerite in the abundant uh, sphalerite in them and sphalerite as a mineral also which is uh, which can be studied and it is uh, it is translucent, translucent or rather transparent in ordinary uh, visible light and we can see fluid inclusions in the sphalerite. So, here we do have a better idea or which a lot of uh, more definitive about the characteristic of the ore fluid when we study such kind of a deposit although we do not get a very good uh, such occurrence in the Indian context or a good documentation. So, it is uh, worth uh, taking up this example or uh, looking at this example this has been taken from the the Lixell uh, Storanum district in Sweden this is one of the Swedish example where we could see the this ore specimen where there are calcite uh, uh, and this the calcite cement within the brexited kind of uh, ore. This is present uh, uh, in the, so generally uh, they are uh, supposedly to be epigenetic in nature and in the kind of uh, cemented calcite and the sphalerite which is uh, shown here. And they do also have fluoride. So, in these kind of deposits the fluid inclusions could be studied in sphalerite and fluoride as well as calcite and give us a better control on the on, un, on in understanding the fluid characteristics. So, the mineralization is in proterozoic basement in the uh, almost of the late proterozoic uh, kind of time and in the form of galenous fluorite and calcite. So, here uh, when the fluid inclusions were studied and the temperature and salinity uh, values were determined it was uh, could be interpreted in terms of uh, the fluid inclusion temperature the homogenization temperature was observed as, as low as even less than 70 degree almost possibly 48 degrees is the homogenization temperature for the lowest inclusion and uh, maximum going up to 200 degree Celsius and the fluid uh, in terms of its salinity uh, variation from as low as uh, uh, 18 weight percent CaCl2 to 30 weight percent Cl, CaCl2 calcium chloride that was determined. And the metals to be inferred to have been leached from the basement rock and uh, transported with the with this fluid. Uh, one thing uh, we know about this particular Mississippi Valley type deposit, uh, they are interesting in a sense that this fluid mo in most of the cases they are interpreted to be basinal fluid, fluid derived from the um, sedimentary rocks, pore spaces of the sedimentary rocks and in this case uh, they are the uh, Cambrian uh, sediments and uh, the here are some of the examples of fluid inclusions from uh, fluorite which you could see that here is an aqueous biphase inclusion which is co which coexists with inclusions where there are hydrocarbon there are some this black uh, things which are occurring inside the inclusion are essentially uh, bitumen 
and uh, even there uh, this uh, liquid part also contains substantial amount of methane. So, this uh, fluid is very characteristic, characteristic in its uh, content of hydrocarbon and then the salinity and the temperature data for the sphalerite and fluorite and the uh, calcite when they are plotted uh, on temperature salinity kind of fluid evolution diagram, the situation becomes very clear that they do represent fluids of different salinities and it is inferred that the mineralization was brought about by a fluid mixing, which uh, in the in the uh, composite diagram which we saw before, uh, we also presented one, uh, we also saw one typical Mississippi valley type deposit, where in most other situations a Mississippi valley type deposit, a fluid mixing trend is generally observed or interpreted. Okay. So, the as we know that the volcanogenic massive sulphide deposits do constitute a very important class of uh, hydrothermal deposits, they are essentially results of sea floor hydrothermal activity whether it is a cypress type uh, VMS deposit occurring in extensional tectonic setting or a Kuroko type deposit which is occurring in a, a convergent type of tectonic setting is in the Japanese island. So, this is one example of a of the Kakun VMS deposit in Sichuan China which are essentially Mesozoic in age younger ones compared to the ones which occur in the uh, Canadian or in, in the in the Abitibi province in Canada. So, in this particular uh, VMS deposit, these are the, this uh, the mineralized mineral mineralization is, sub, is basically can be divided into the massive uh, sulphide ore, the upper uh, massive ore, and the middle stringer ore. This, uh, as we as we know, the typical geometry of a volcanogenic massive sulphide deposit, where we get the massive sulphide lens. The massive sulphide lens is immediately uh, below is, uh, is, a, the, is the foot wall volcanics in which we get the stringer and in this particular situation it is the uh, designated as the middle stringer ore and the lower stringer ore which is also a stock work type of zone generally where we see uh, chloritic type of alteration. And the fluid inclusion characteristics in terms of the salinity and uh, uh, temperature are shown here where you could see the temperature going to uh, in the upper massive uh, upper massive ore going to 380 or so in both in this case also more than 300 in all these cases and the salinity value uh, also going to 20 wet percent equivalent. So, when we see this we know that they actually do not quite exactly correspond to what could have been a characteristic of a sea water which we know as one of the major contributor in a volcanogenic massive sulphide deposit. So, if we uh, look at this data the temperature and salinity here the uh, people the, the, uh, the authors who studied this particular deposit they interpreted their data in terms of mixing trend in which uh, the inclusion types that they saw was there is aqueous biphase inclusions, carbon dioxide dominated biphase inclusions, aqueous carbonic inclusions, halide bearing inclusions, multiple daughter phase aqueous inclusions and carbon dioxide dominated vapor inclusions. So, here as uh, one of the important one of the uh, characteristic feature of this particular occurrence of VMS which is, is that the fluid has carbon dioxide in it and the mixing. So, this is the generally the uh, characteristic of this this boundary represents sea water which is about 3.5 wet percent and when we see uh, temp uh, the water the fluid characteristic which is way above the salinity and temperature compared to the sea water we could always interpret in terms of a fluid coming from different sources. And when we see a typical uh, model for the volcanogenic massive sulphide deposit we see uh, there is a sub volcanic uh, sub or, uh, or other we could be calling as a sub plutonic uh, felsic uh, magmatic body which uh, gives rise to the uh, fluid. And then there is a uh, impervious uh, cap which keeps the fluid and the, uh, with its uh, metal uh, content. And then there is a two, two stage kind of uh, convection cell in the upper part and then with, uh, with generation of this kind of the mixing of these two fluids take place after uh, in response to kind of little uh, deformation faulting of the impervious layer. And these two, two kind of fluids they mix together mix and then give rise to 
demineralization. So, there is always a possibility of fluids very close to sea water salinity and temperature to mix with fluids of higher salinity and temperature have been derived by some other magmatic source or sometimes also it is, uh, it is speculated that this sea water also could have undergone a boiling or is uh, by give and then it gives rise to uh, components which are differing salinity uh, higher and uh, lower salinity vapor and a higher salinity liquid. But in this particular case the author they visualize this kind of mixing trend. If we compare uh, so, it would be worth looking at a typically old Archean uh, VMS district uh, in Quebec. This is the Matagami VMS district in Quebec. So, it is as compared to the one which we just saw this uh, in this particular deposit where the uh, it is also being uh, uh, subdivided the mineralization into a into a cracking zone which is essentially the stock work uh, zone where the uh, fluid is supposed to be of a higher temperature and so this you have inclusions in quartz epidote van in the cracking zone which homogenizes temperature up to 373 degrees Celsius or and also have salinity weight percent up to 38 uh, weight percent and SCL VMS. The high T high temperature brine overlain by low temperature salinity fluid they indicates to the exactly the what we were discussing now this convection in a typically typical volcanogenic massive sulphate deposit is can be divided in space into a lower uh, 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 circulating cell which is dominantly contributed by a high temperature high saline fluid of possible magmatic derivation and a lower temperature and variable salinity fluid which could be a sea water which percolates through the fractured spaces and uh, the mixing uh, takes place. So, here in this particular uh, mold uh, which is deposit is, over, is in the uh, Matagami VMS district in Quebec which is in the Abitibi province in Canada where this high T brine that is overlain by a low temperature low salinity fluid it indicates that there is a two cell convection and the presence of high salinity inclusions indicate the transport of the high saline fluid to uh, upper. So, whenever we say uh, we find fluid inclusions of moderately high salinity then there is always a possibility that uh, that is created when the uh, the lower the, there is a mixing between the low and the high circulating cells and the warning of the hydrothermal circulation is allows the sea water to circulate deeper modified by fluid rock interaction and then they are represented by fluid inclusions which homogenize into somewhat intermediate values of temperature of 250 degrees Celsius. So, here are the examples uh, the fluid inclusions which are these are the primary aqueous biphase inclusion from the VMS uh, zone this kind of polyphase inclusions are coming from the cracking zone which are the lower uh, zone which is dominated by magmatic magmatically derived high saline high temperature fluid. And uh, the one here this is also a situation which is after the towards the warning of the after the mixing of the low the lower and the upper cell and the fluids of moderate salinity and these uh, inclusion type were also compared with a with the with the tin inclusions taken from the veins in a nearby uh, granite uh, pluton which is later than the mineralization just for comparison. Now, the uh, difference or the characteristic uh, feature of this particular the fluid system that is uh, there in the Matagami VMS district is we do not see any carbon dioxide uh, in the fluid. Uh, so, here the, the authors interpreted this, this fluid to have evolved in this kind of a manner. This represent the, the uh, this uh, situation corresponding to the cracking zone where the uh, it is actually the stock work uh, quartz epidote vents and the, the originally the, the magmatically derived fluid uh, was confined to that part. And then this black circle represent the VMS the main VMS bob uh, zone and the uh, this is the hanging wall uh, sulphide region where we still the, temp the fluid has evolved to a lower temperature with the mixing and uh, this part is <coughs> is the fluid that is sampled from the quartz van in the later granitic phase. But the fluid as, as, as exemplified as or has been the 
uh, seen from the fluid inclusion types and the distribution in different uh, special zones uh, could be interpreted in terms of uh, the mixing of these fluids and giving rise to the vulcanogenic massive this sulphide massive sulphide lens. And sometimes this uh, with the later incursion of the fluid we also do get uh, later uh, veins quasipedoid veins. Uh, so, here uh, this is uh, a one of the good example of characteristic of the VMS deposit. Uh, even though we do not uh, have many such deposits in the Indian subcontinent, the only one possibly of a the one which is the uh, from Dharwar Taton the deposit which is reported as the Ingalgal deposit, but uh, there is no such uh, uh, full fluid characteristic documentation is it available. So, that uh, brings us to the end of these today's lecture and uh, we will see uh, another one or two examples of uh, application of fluid inclusion microthermometric data to ore forming environment and we will continue in the next class. Thank you.